Salam, buongiorno. Welcome back to Adventures in Language. I'm your guide, Caitlin. In this video, we're talking about the relationship between music and language. Music and language are both complex, creative, and uniquely human. We're going to talk about how much they have in common and how music may affect language learning. Are you ready? Let's get started. Today's video is part of a set of videos about the individual factors that influence language learning. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and be the first to know when new videos come out. In essence, language is a system of communication and music is a form of artistic expression. On the surface, they may seem pretty different, but there are good reasons to think that music and language would have a special relationship. There are three similarities between music and language that we're going to talk about today. So let's break these down. Number one, music and language are both made up of sounds. Maybe obvious, sure, but stay with me here, okay? Music can be produced using a wide variety of instruments, including the vocal tract, which is the instrument of choice for language. Now, a quick side note, because sound is such a crucial link here, we're focusing in this video on the relationship between music and spoken languages, but we did link some really cool resources for you on music and sign language, so be sure to check those out if you're interested. Now, it's not simply that music and language are both made up of sounds. In fact, the sounds that make up music and language are based on many of the same acoustic features, like frequency, duration, intensity, and timbre. In music, frequency is what gives each note on a scale its unique sound and tells you how high or low the notes are. This information helps the listener understand the melody and meaning of a piece. In language, frequency determines which consonants, like D or T, and vowels, like A or A, we hear. Frequency is also related to intonation or pitch, which is important for expressing emotion, emphasis, or even the meaning of words in tonal languages like Mandarin. Duration, that's how long a sound lasts. Musical notes vary in duration. Think of the opening sequence of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, which has sets of three short notes followed by a long one. Dun 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 dun. In language, different speech sounds have different durations. For example, Low vowels like ah uh, are generally longer than high vowels like e, and fricatives like s are longer than stop consonants like t. In some languages, the duration of a consonant or vowel can actually change the meaning of the word. For example, in Japanese, kite means to come and kite means postage stamp. Intensity refers to loudness or volume, which plays an important role in how both music and language are perceived by the listener. And finally, timbre is the quality of the sound that helps us identify which instruments we're hearing in an orchestra or tell different speakers apart in language. Number two, music and language are both hierarchically structured systems arranged in time. Just as language is not a haphazard combination of sounds and words, music is not a random assortment of notes and chords. There are rules and principles that determine how the elements of both music and language can be combined and arranged. If you want to learn more about how this works in language, check out our episode on how sentences work. These sets of rules are known as grammar in language and harmonic structure in music. And when the rules are broken, a little light bulb goes off in our brains. Well, not exactly, but this brings us to the third major similarity between language and music. Number three, music and language rely on similar networks in the brain. Okay, so this is so cool because actually we know that at least to some extent, music and language are stored separately in the brain. How do we know this? Well, people can suffer brain damage like from a stroke and lose language abilities but still retain their musical skills or vice versa. One famous example of this is the Russian composer, Visarion Shebalin, who had severe language impairments following multiple strokes, 
but retained his musical talent and went on to publish several impressive musical compositions. Wow. However, modern brain imaging techniques have shown us that in spite of these differences, there's actually a lot of overlap in how and where music and language are processed in the brain. Studies have shown that our brains process the structure of music and language in very similar, if not identical ways. Also, changes in pitch in both music and language elicit similar neural responses. Okay, now check this out. Our brains also seem to treat notes and chords like the vocabulary of music. There's a known neural response to unexpected words and sentences. Like when you hear something like, I'm happiest when I'm taking long walks on the telescope. The same or very similar neural response is observed when people hear an unexpected note in a melody. How cool is that? So given the similarities between music and language, it seems likely that talented musicians should be good at learning new languages. And there's quite a bit of research to support this theory. Musicians are really good at detecting subtle differences in pitch, not only in music, but also in their native languages and even in languages that they're not familiar with. Pitch detection is a pretty important skill for learning tone languages like Mandarin Chinese, Thai, or Swahili. Why? Well, in tone languages, the meaning of a word can change depending on its pitch or tone. For example, in Mandarin, the word ma means mom. Easy enough so far, right? But changing the tone of the word can change its meaning to something completely different. Being able to tell these tones apart comes in handy when trying to learn them, and experienced musicians are better at this. Interestingly, the facilitative effect between musical ability and pitch seems to go both ways. Speakers of tone languages are more likely to have perfect pitch than speakers of non-tonal languages. Now, if you've been following this series, you may remember that sound discrimination ability is a key part of language aptitude, which itself can predict how successful you might be at language learning. Beyond pitch, musicians are usually, though not always, better at distinguishing between other kinds of sounds based on information about frequency, duration, and intensity. For example, musicians are better at distinguishing between short and long versions of consonants. Remember kita and kita from earlier? And this is often a challenge for language learners. Interestingly, it isn't just seasoned musicians who have a leg up in language learning. Some studies have shown that brief amounts of musical training, as little as six months, can help children become better at identifying the boundaries between words and at processing pitch in an unfamiliar language. And even when non-musicians can tell sounds apart just as accurately as musicians, musicians show stronger brain responses to sound differences. So this suggests that musical experiences helps people perceive differences in language, even if they aren't explicitly aware of them. This also supports the idea that musical expertise leads to changes in areas of the brain that are important for language learning and processing. Now, most studies have looked at musical expertise or experience, but what if you just happen to have an aptitude for music? It's pretty hard to tease these apart because it's likely that people with high musical ability are the ones who are drawn to become musicians in the first place. But studies that have specifically focused on aptitude show that both children and adults with high musical aptitude have better pronunciation in their second language than those with low musical aptitude. So aptitude on its own does seem to make a difference. Okay, so being musically inclined or having musical experience can set us up to be good language learners. But there's another important connection between music and language. We can actually learn language through music. Actually, we can learn a lot of things through music. Shout out to any elementary school or preschool teachers out there watching and saying, yeah, tell us something we don't know. Nursery rhymes and other short repetitive songs are ubiquitous in early childhood education, and they're key for building literacy and knowledge in young children. But songs can also be used to teach other subjects like history, science, and even math. Research has shown that repetitive songs like the wheels on the bus, accompanied by gestures and actions, can help young second language learners pick up new vocabulary. Even adults can benefit from catchy refrains. 
In one study, adult learners who listened to and analyzed classic rock songs as part of their English classes improved their ability to recognize and use words contained in the lyrics. Songs have also been shown to promote the acquisition of grammatical patterns and phrases when combined with activities that draw students' attention to what they're learning. There is one caveat to these research findings. Songs don't appear to be any better for learning vocabulary or grammar than traditional teaching activities are. And learning through songs alone is pretty slow going. However, songs are particularly effective at boosting learners' enjoyment of language classes, which could ultimately lead to more learning by increasing motivation. All right, my friends, that brings us to the end of our video. Now let's take a minute to recap what we've learned. First, music and language are different systems with a lot of similarities. In particular, they're both made up of sounds with similar acoustic features, they're both highly structured, and they rely on a lot of overlapping processes in the brain. Second, if you're an accomplished musician, there's a good chance that language learning will come easy to you, especially when it comes to learning the sounds of a new language. And third, music is also a great tool for language learning. So go out there and make some playlists in the language you're learning. Well, that is the end of this video and the end of season one of the Science Behind Language Learning series. If you haven't caught our previous videos in this series, go check them out. We have 14 videos on topics like the differences between first and second languages, age effects in language learning, and language learning motivation. If you liked this video, let us know by subscribing, liking, and reviewing the show. For more fun content, you can always follow us on your favorite social media platform at Mango Languages. Thanks for watching and have fun on your language learning adventures. Kuda hafez. Arrivederci. Be sure to check out the description for this episode for some free materials on music and language, including some tips on how to make music a part of your language learning journey. Thanks for watching. Bye.